80 gigabit from a mobile Zen 4 core? I seem to have strayed somewhat from my original topic. <laughs> yeah, so that's 12 Keoxia PM7 SAS SSDs, which I have bolted onto a mobile CPU through M.2 adapters. It wasn't even meant to have that. But I got a little carried away trying to build a small forbidden router slash home network server appliance. I'm looking for the perfect combination, the perfect permutation of all of the available hardware. And I learned some things. I will probably do some things a little differently the second time around. But this little thing only has a 200 watt power supply that I had to hand solder and a 100 gigabit Mellanox fiber optic interface and it can run at 8 gigabytes per second or 80 gigabit. That can be a Steam cache, it can provide iSCSI, file storage. It has 8 Zen 4 cores, 16 threads, that can boost up to 5 gigahertz. This is the little motherboard that I reviewed on AliExpress. But uh, there's a little more to it than that. Come with me. Let's talk about it. So this is an ITX motherboard with a 3D printed case. The motherboard we've reviewed previously, this version of the motherboard has the 8845HS with the Radeon 780M. And this motherboard takes a weirdo LGA1700 mounting system because it's a mobile processor and has a copper shim. The other thing that attracted me to this motherboard was that it has a built-in uh, eight SATA ports through, you know, mini SAS type connectors. And so you can plug in a cable like this for a square connector on one end and four SATA cables on the other and run eight or nine SATA hard drives. Problem is that eight or nine SATA hard drives, even for SSDs, they're not gonna push eight gigabytes per second. And I was so impressed by the performance, I wanted to see how far I could push this thing. It's gonna be a Docker host, it's gonna run Home Assistant, it's gonna do file storage. Really, it's a replica for my home lab, my HL15 system. You know, the blast radius of losing the HL15, it's gonna take out Home Assistant and the Plex Media Server and the Forbidden Router and a whole bunch of other things. And I wanted a secondary system to be able to run this. For a while, I've been using ASRock's N1000 motherboard, which is four core, four N100 cores. And I really liked that, especially how little power that used. And so that got me thinking, could I build a high horsepower version of this that similarly uses very little power? The base power for this, seven watts. And I've got 96 gigabytes of crucial memory in there with four built-in NICs. Now that power usage is completely blown out of the water when I add mechanical hard drives or even our Keoxia PM7 hard drives along with our 100 gigabit Mellanox interface. But seven watts as a floor is fantastic for an idle system that's just hanging out on your network, not necessarily doing anything. So I said about doing the 3D printable case thing. And there's a really good eight bay NAS that you can get on printables.com and you can print it on a Prusa or other larger volume 3D printers. And so this will hold eight three and a half inch hard drives. And this was great. But eight three and a half inch hard drives did not at all remotely stress this machine. I mean, look at this motherboard. It's got so many cool quality of life features, like the little LEDs in the corner to indicate what's going on. Now this is an X8 interface, and it has two X4 interfaces for M.2. One of them I'm taking to a breakout, to a SAS controller, and that SAS controller will support up to 16 devices through eight PCIe lanes. I'm only using four PCIe lanes, but it works really well with this platform. So this is another adapter that you can order on the internet or get from AliExpress. Basically, it goes PCIe Gen 4 Oculink M.2 adapter. So you shove this in your M.2 slot, and then you've got an Oculink connector, and then you can use an Oculink cable to an X16 breakout. Now there's an X8 version of this as well, but in our case, it doesn't really make sense to use that unless you wanted to use the X4 for your network interface. I think if you're gonna use 10 gigabit, you would be better off using one of those M.2 cheat codes to go to 10 gigabit ethernet because that keeps your PCIe slot free. And the fact that this has a Radeon 780M built in means that you can access and use those hardware transcoders. I know a lot of you out there prefer to use an NVIDIA card. An option for you there might be the ADA 4000 SFF generation that we reviewed previously. That is overkill, that's like a $1,500 card, but it uses like 70 watts of power most of the time. I'm gonna take a look at an A1000 soon as a low power option that is relatively low cost. We'll see how that goes, but that'll be for a future video. And then I said about 3D printing, uh, sort of a modified version of that case, 
that would hold 12 millimeter, 12 and 15 millimeter, two and a half inch drives as opposed to mechanical hard drives. And NVMe doesn't do it because if you put 12 NVMe, there's just not enough NVMe lanes to connect up 12 drives. That's just madness. But SAS, SAS can do a gigabyte per second easily from each one of these PM7s. Actually, the PM7 specs are quite good. If you look at the Keoxia specs for the PM7 read write enterprise performance, these are designed to replace mechanical 15,000 RPM hard drives. And this is an excellent use case for that. You've got an old server that you, you know, it was three, four, five years old that you had 10,000 or 15,000 two and a half inch hard drives in it. It is an insane upgrade to replace those mechanical hard drives with high performance SAS flash. And for the enterprise market, the SAS flash drives are, yeah, they're not as fast as NVMe and they don't have the features that NVMe does, but in terms of easy upgrade path, that is a winning product for easy upgrade path for existing enterprise solutions. Also, depending on what you're looking for, if you really do need a hardware RAID controller to support a legacy software ecosystem or anything like that, that is a path to do that. Although I really don't recommend hardware RAID controllers in new, you know, deploying as part of new solutions in 2024 because software managed um, storage volumes generally are a better idea in 2024, whichever route you want to go with that. Microsoft has storage spaces. ZFS, of course, is the popular open source one that I like, but there's tons of open and closed systems for managing <laughs> data sets, files, objects, etc across a pool of storage that is mixed flash and mechanical storage, might just be pure mechanical storage. Turns out software can manage that at a higher level a little bit better than lower level stuff. That's a story for another day or another different set of videos for another day. The other problem I ran into was power supplies and power supplies efficiency. This is a 200 watt 80 plus gold power supply, but it's only 200 watts. Like this whole system actually most of the time is using less than 200 watts, even with eight mechanical hard drives. Okay, with eight mechanical hard drives, we are pushing a fair bit there, but in order to have a power supply that is efficiency at the relatively low end of the curve, you don't really need a lot of watts. And then the power supply takes up a lot of space. So using a recycled ATX-ish power supply that I had to solder some extra wires on, but hey, it can deliver 200 watts on the 12 volt rail, which is basically all we need. And that will get the job done. Now, as for software, that's up to you. It's a whole universe of possibilities. If you haven't learned about iSCSI, well, let me to introduce you to iSCSI. If you have software on a storage device like this with iSCSI and you enable iSCSI, every built-in version of Windows for the last decade pretty much has a built-in what's called iSCSI initiator. So if you go into control panel and you connect to this thing with iSCSI after you've created a volume for this on iSCSI, you can have a volume that only one computer can attach to at a time over the network, but it is treated exactly the same as a local hard disk. So if you installed games or anything like that, you can have them running over the network off of a hard drive in your computer, but it's not actually a hard drive in your computer. It actually runs over the network. And so you can do that with a 10 gigabit or a 25 gigabit, or as I've done here, a 100 gigabit network. And with a 25 gigabit NIC, your maximum throughput is about 2.5 gigabytes per second with a very low latency. So it feels better, honestly, than a SATA hard drive as long as the rest of the storage backend is fast enough to keep up. ZFS doesn't have as low latency numbers as you would have even from a local SATA hard drive. But for game storage, it's like I want to have my Steam store on something that looks and acts like a local hard drive, something that programs don't know is not a local hard drive, which is maybe the important thing. It'll run just fine over iSCSI. We have some guides for that on the level one forum that you should check out if you've never heard of this iSCSI thing. It can be really handy. But remember, only one machine at a time can be attached to iSCSI. Asterisk, yes, there are some ways to have more than one machine attached to iSCSI at the same time, but you need some sort of arbitration or control software. And that is a very much not a video for today. And of course, you can also use it for regular network storage. And iSCSI works whether it's flash or mechanical storage. I just wanted to push the envelope with 80 gigabit. Now here's what I've, I've learned and thought about. Our NAS motherboard has four built-in two and a half gig NICs, which is great for a forbidden router type scenario. But as I was working on this, it occurred to me that like in a system like this, if I were really building something this powerful and given that I've got the HL15 for the other side of my home lab, which is the Plex Media Server. And so yeah, like if Plex Media Server goes down, it's just gonna be down because I've only got it on the one node. This, this node is serving mission critical things like Home Assistant, Forbidden Router, the wireless controller, all of that kind of stuff that I really don't wanna go down during maintenance windows or anything like that for, for my home setup. And so 
looking at that, I thought, well, you know, the switch, the Ethernet switch is really doing the heavy lifting and really doing the magic here. A setup that makes sense is to actually take the modems, you know, from your ISP, if you have more than one ISP, maybe you have a primary and a backup ISP, and plug those into a VLAN on your switch. And then you have your software forbidden router that's also on the same VLANs for the WAN and WAN2 sides of that software. And so you have a virtual machine that is connecting to a different VLAN on your switch uh, for Internet Service Provider 1, Internet Service Provider 2, your local LAN VLAN, maybe you have a wireless guest VLAN and that sort of thing. And you really only need one or two most ridiculously high speed interfaces in order to do that. A lot of the time in the in the sort of the, the ghetto fabulous forbidden router, I'll just use the two and a half gig ports or the built-in ports, the other built-in ports to connect the modems from the ISP. But then if this physical piece of hardware goes down, I've got to shuffle around the connections somewhere else and have the ports. Whereas if I just set it up from day one so that these machines are attached directly to the switch and the switch is connected directly to the ISP modems, it's much less likely that the switch is ever going to experience a problem in its lifetime. Generally, that's not always true, generally. And it's also much easier to set up a redundant switch configuration where I've got two identical switches and it's like, oh, something happened with my ISP connection. It doesn't really matter. I can just, I can physically move the cable if the modem only has one port or if the modem has more than one port, I can just have both connected all the time. Could work. So as for the software, I'm not sure yet. Engagement challenge, what software have you used and do you really like? Right now I'm running vanilla Linux. And with vanilla Linux, I can add ZFS on Linux. I can add my iSCSI volumes and I can basically do everything from the command line. And that's based on the Debian operating system. I'm actually using uh, the Debian SID, which is you know the bleedingest edge version of Debian. Uh, I've also retested Open Media Vault recently, and I'm very impressed with the changes that have come in Open Media Vault. And so that may be worth another look. It has a nice ICSI GUI. Unraid is probably also worth a revisit in 2024. TrueNAS, of course, is you know the old reliable standby. Uh, there's some hoops that you have to jump through with networking and Docker, and they're changing the way the, the Kubernetes cluster configuration thing works. So there's a lot of a lot of things happening under the hood um, with TrueNAS, but you know, fun times. And then there's other things you could use for your host operating system like Proxmox. I am using Proxmox to manage the virtual machines aspect of this so that I have a virtual machine that migrates from one physical host to the other. And this is Zen 4 and my home server running in the HL15 is also Zen 4. And so that makes things a little easier migrating things back and forth. The DHL15 idle power, a little bit higher than the idle power of the mobile uh, CPUs, but hey, it makes it so that I can take the HL15 offline and do something fancy with it and then put it back. So that's fun and that's interesting. I can't think of anything else untoward that I ran into with this with this setup and, and with this build. Um, I, I want to do some more content with this, but it may be just in the forum at level one text, uh, or maybe if somebody has any interesting use cases for this or, or something in particular that they want to see. Mostly I was just very impressed that yes, I actually can squeeze 80 gigabit out of this thing using two cores, two of my it's eight cores, 16 threads. I'm just using two threads, but really you're not gonna get anything done on the other two threads. So let's just say two cores, two of my eight cores will keep that Mellanox Nick fully engaged at 100 gigabit, just come as you are on the LAN. And that is very, very, I can't, that is, it's a mobile CPU powering 100 gigabit Nick with all those channels of Keoxia SAS storage and the CPU utilization, that's how far CPUs have come. Because doing that with an older Xeon, like a 2680 V3 saturating 80 gigabit with like iSCSI threads, you're, it's, if it's a two socket system, you're basically using one entire socket in order to be able to do that. So this is very impressive. At the same time, I don't know that I would recommend it because look at look at the build that we ended up with. I'm not using the onboard SATA drives at all, and I really need to. Like, I'm probably going to dial this back for the video and then actually swap in mechanical hard drives. So just for the video, I've put the Keoxia SAS SSDs on it because I mean these are like eight terabytes each. It would be a waste to just use this for static storage. This is high performance flash made for like VMs and storage and and everything else that you know, is active and running. A media server doesn't need to run from flash. 
You can even spin down your hard drives to stay on power if you have infrequently accessed stuff. The SSDs are for lots and lots and lots of concurrent random I.O. and lots of virtual machines. Maybe AI processing a dozen camera feeds or something like that, but even then the camera feeds make more sense to go to mechanical storage, not flash. So I've built this amazing thing that actually can run at 80 gigabit, but I think I'm gonna have to rethink how I build something like this because really, if you're gonna go the forbidden router route and you leverage a smart switch, you really don't need a lot of physical network connections on the host. And that may be the next thing that I look at because it also makes it easy to replicate the physical setup on the multiple hosts in a cluster. So that makes the failover easier as well. It's giving me some things to think about. I'm Wendell, this is Level One, I'm signing out. You can find me in the Level One forums. Let's discuss your needs. I'm signing out, I'll see you there.